There's people that are coming with type 1 diabetes in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. What is happening in our biology that this is the case? It's a, it's a phenomenal question. The, the truth is that nobody knows the answer to that question. And there are a lot of uh, like hypotheses from the scientific world that have been tested and seem to be linked to type 1 diabetes uh, you know, formation. But there's no like smoking gun, like, oh, this is, this is the reason why people are developing type 1 diabetes. However, the things that, that we know do contribute to type 1 diabetes are, uh, number one, there are certain types of viruses that you can contract um, that can actually uh, affect your immune system in a way where your immune system goes and uh, gets tricked into believing that there are specific proteins on the, on the beta cells that need to be targeted for destruction. So a virus can cause it. Um, there's also, as far as our food is concerned, there's two leading theories about what could potentially cause type 1 diabetes. One of them is cow's milk, believe it or not. Um, and there are proteins inside of cow's milk that are very similar in their, in their amino acid sequence to some of the proteins that are on the surface of the beta cells inside of your pancreas. So what ends up happening is that you consume milk uh, at a young age, and you consume a good amount of it, as we were all told, because you know it was the 80s and it was cool, and we saw billboards of Andre Agassi drinking milk, and so that's what we did, <laughs> right? And so over the course of time, the more milk you drink, what ends up happening is that it causes um, gut permeability. In other words, there are microscopic holes in the lining of your gut that actually get caused as a result of inflammatory molecules coming through your gut at all times. And so some of the, like, when proteins come into your gut, they're, they're supposed to get chopped into individual amino acids, or sometimes two or sometimes three at the most. But what ends up happening is if, when you have these holes that are like perforations inside of your gut, then uh, amino, acid, I'm sorry, uh, amino acid chains can end up escaping into your bloodstream when they're larger than three amino acids. So they can be four, five, seven, 10, 15, 20 amino acids long. So now you have these foreign amino acid chains that are inside of your blood where they're not supposed to be. And your immune system takes a look at it and says, what is that? I did not make that. Kill that protein immediately. Yeah, yeah. So your immune system basically mounts an attack and it creates antibodies that are specifically designed to degrade those non-human amino acid chains. The problem is that when those amino acid chains are very similar to amino acid chains that are inside of your body, then your immune system can easily get tricked and it's this process called molecular mimicry where your immune system says, oh, hey, look, that's a non-human amino acid chain. Kill that. And then it goes and finds another one, which is so similar, maybe it's only different by one amino acid, and then starts to kill that one as well. And if, if those amino acid chains happen to be on the surface of a beta cell, then goodbye beta cell. So that's what kills the cells. That's, that's, one, of the, yeah, that's one of the theories as to what could potentially be contributing to type 1 diabetes. Um, and then there's this other thing, there's one other thing that I'll talk about real quickly called MAP, which is called Mycobacterium avium paratuberculosis. It's a long word, don't remember that. All it is is it's basically, it's a, uh, it's a bacteria that's found in the gut of, of uh, ruminants. So basically these are like land grazing cows, right? So in these industrial farms, when MAP gets inside of the gut of these animals, it can actually kill the animal. So MAP is in some of these animals because some of these animals are diseased. When they poop, it, the MAP is in their fecal matter. It gets on the boots of the workers. It gets on the gloves of the workers. Then when they go to actually slaughter these animals, the MAP ends up inside of the meat, and it ends up inside of the milk. And some of this MAP can be resistant to pasteurization. And so when you go to the grocery store, you're buying meat and you're buying milk that actually has MAP in it. And then when you consume it, the MAP can actually be causational in type 1 diabetes through a similar process as I just so described. So you're saying that dairy and meat are two big reasons why people get diabetic when we all thought, I'll speak for myself, I thought it was just sugar. And now you're bringing in two other very strong reasons why kids or babies get type 1 diabetes and then kids and now adults. Is that why it's what Dottie Yeah, asked? exactly right. So so here's the, the what, you're, what you're hitting on here I think is very important, which is that, like I said before, you know, milk can be, uh, is associated with an increased risk for type 1 diabetes. Uh, meat is associated with an increased risk for type 1 diabetes. Both of those foods are also 
associated with an increased risk for prediabetes and type 2 diabetes mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. But not for the molecular mimicry reasons, basically because they're high in saturated fat, and saturated fat contributes to insulin resistance like we talked about, which can then progress into a uh, type 2 diabetes state where eating carbohydrate-rich anything becomes a huge problem. We talked about Robbie's origin story. Cyrus, you also were diagnosed when you were at Stanford, and then you felt terrible on what the doctors were telling you to do. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what you discovered, uh, a way that worked for you, and basically was the genesis of your uh -huh. nutritional coaching for diabetics and for your company that you have with Robbie? That's exactly right. So... I was 22. I was going to Stanford University at the time. I was a senior. And all of a sudden, I felt terrible. I mean, I, I had very similar symptoms to what Robbie had described. I was, I was thirsty all the time. I had no energy. And um, I was driving myself crazy because I, I would just try and study. And then I would take a sip of water. And then I would try and study some more. And I was like, wow, I'm getting thirstier. So I'll take another sip. And then I would drink. And I was like, I am getting thirstier every minute of the day. This doesn't make any sense. And so I called my sister, who's a, a doctor of osteopathy, and I said, hey, Shanaz, I have these symptoms. Can you please explain it to me? And she started crying. Like She she's, keeps herself together a lot of the time. She started crying immediately. She said, go straight to the health center. You have type 1 diabetes. So at that time, I'm, I'm thinking, type 1 diabetes? Like, I, I don't have diabetes, Shanaz. And she goes, I don't have time to explain, but just go. And at that time, I was very ignorant. I thought diabetes had something to do with old people and cake. That's it. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so here I am like, which it may, okay, well. but that's not an entire story. <laughs> so neither of those applied to me. So long story short, I ended up going to the hospital. I ended up, uh, they gave me, they checked my blood glucose. It was in the 600s, six times higher than it needed to be. And then 24 hours later, I was discharged with a blood glucose meter, a prescription for insulin, uh, test strips, a life alert bracelet and a carbohydrate counting guide. And I returned to my dorm room and I was like, you have got to be kidding me. I just turned into a medical patient mm. overnight. This doesn't make any sense. So the doctors at that time told me that the only way to live with type 1 diabetes was to eat a low-carbohydrate diet because that's all that they knew at that time, and that's, that information is still being passed around even today. And so I tried to limit my carbohydrate intake. Mm. I tried to bring it down to like 75, maybe 100, 125 grams a day. Um, but you know, I'm an athlete and I love to play soccer and I love to go to the gym and lift weights. And I got to say, you know, when, when I'm sitting there eating turkey burgers for breakfast and eggs for lunch and ham and cheese for dinner, I didn't have very much energy. Mm -mm. And I noticed that my muscles were hurting, my joints were hurting and my blood glucose was a freaking nightmare. And so, you know, a year into this process, I decided, okay, I got to make a change because clearly this is not working for me. And then I started looking up things on the internet and I came across this guy whose name was Dr. Doug Graham. And Dr. Doug Graham was holding a retreat and he teaches people how to eat a raw food diet. So I said, hey, Doug, if you can help me, I'm all ears. And he said, Cyrus, just come over here. I'm about to blow your mind. So I said, great. I love the confidence. <laughs> so I go to his retreat. Uh, within a week, um, I dropped my insulin use by 40% in seven days. But here's the kicker. My carbohydrate intake went from 125 grams to 650 grams per day. So I effectively five tupled my carbohydrate intake and I cut my insulin use by 40%. Wow. So the two of them were going in opposite And just directions. to be clear, again, for people, those are complex, whole food, fiber rich, complex carbohydrates. What, so throw out some foods. What, yeah. what were you eating? What filled up those 600 grams? Mangoes, grapes, bananas, plantains, uh, tomatoes, zucchini, uh, pineapples. Uh, this is, this is a r raw food experience because uh, that's what Doug Graham taught me how to do. Mm -hmm. So we're not eating sweet potatoes. We're not eating quinoa and brown rice. So, you know, any fruit you can think of, any vegetable you can think of, boom, put it in my mouth. It was great. Low fat, right? Yes, very low fat. So, so he, Doug Graham went on to write a book called The 80-10-10 Diet. So he basically is saying the optimal diet for human beings is 80% carbohydrate, 10% fat, 10% protein. Hey, folks. Okay. Back by very popular demand is our plant-powered plate fridge magnet, which you are going to receive for free if you leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. So here are the details. 
just write your quick review. Does not need to be long, does not need to be a whole story. Just be honest and speak from the heart. Then take a quick screenshot of the review you wrote and email it to us at podcast at switchforgood.org. That's podcast at switchforgood.org. And include your mailing address so we can send you a power plate. We are doing this because the more reviews we garner, the higher we go in search results, which means more folks will learn about our podcast. So the power is in your hands. Leave us a review and zoom, zoom, your power plate arrives at your doorstep. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.